Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Gregory Manyatis. I am the director of the International Migration Initiative here at the Open Society Foundations. Thank you for, for joining us this evening, both here live uh, at OSF, but also uh, via the webcast, the live webcast. I'm here with um, Evgeny Efeyanevsky, who is the Oscar-nominated uh, director and creative mind behind Cries from Syria. Uh, we have just seen uh, the production. Um, it is probably the hardest uh, documentary I've ever seen in terms of its impact. Uh, before we get into a conversation, I just want to share a couple of programming notes. We are grateful to those who have submitted questions uh, online to Evgeny. Um, we'll continue to take questions uh, to, from those of you who are watching the web webcast during our conversation. If you're on Facebook now, you can leave a question in the comments below. If you're on the Open Society Foundation's uh, website, you can submit questions by clicking on the chat icon. Uh, on the top right corner of the web webcast and submit questions there. And we'll also open it up to uh, questions from the audience. Um, so that was um, this uh, truly unreal combination of humanity and inhumanity. The images um, of devastation contrasted with the, um, the voices of those who have suffered so much. Um, I think what will stay with me is that when you hear the voices of the children, um, if you took away the, the images and you just heard what they said, it would be as if you were talking to the most wizened 60, 70 year old people. Um, and yet they have, uh, accelerated, you know, their entire, you know, life. I mean, they've experienced in three or six or ten years what what uh, none of us should ever experience, and they've distilled it down into sort of the essence of humanity. Um, what I wanted to ask you is where your entry point was for the documentary. So we're in the middle of a displacement crisis that's the largest since World War II. Uh, the reason why we are reached something like 65 million displaced is the conflict in Syria. You end the film with uh, scenes of Syrians leaving uh, Syria, trying to make it to Turkey and Europe. Was that what started you down the path of, of the film? Or was it the conflict uh, initially just trying to explain what was happening in Syria? I was actually... Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I was actually finishing Winter on Fire, Ukrainian Fight for Freedom. That was my previous movie. And I was in Europe. And I learned through the media about huge waves of refugees that happened in 2015. And media was portraying these waves of refugees that people coming to take over the European Union. And uh, you hear about the boats, you hear about literally people uh, afraid of these refugees, uh, all this Islamic invasion. And I was in Europe. I not f kind of felt this. I started to talk to the people. And the, I found out that A, 27 to 30% only come into European Union from Syria. The rest coming from different other places like Afghanistan, uh, Libya, Tunis, uh, African countries. And then I also learned some other things that they are escaping from the war. And then September 2015, Ilan Kurdi found on a shore that making a breaking news, this image of this three-year-old child, this captivated entire world. Then it's Russia coming to fight with ISIS. The announcement that came officially and all more and more news from Syria. Already in the summer 2015, I was trying to find the characters in the European Union. But talking to the people in the European Union made me to understand that that's not the answer. You need to, in order to understand all these events, you need to find the chain and go back in time in order to understand these people. And uh, I realized that I need to reconstruct the history 
go back to the Syria Syrian border to all where it started. And like with the time machine, recreate the picture in order to understand what motivates these people to drop everything and despite possible death in the Mediterranean, go and try to survive. And I went to look for the characters. This journey took me for in two year journey that I finished this movie. And during the course of this journey, I found out that it started with the kids, like you just saw, with the kids who were so inspired by the Arab Spring in 2011, did the simple graffiti on the walls. Did the simple graffiti on the walls stating, it's your turn, doctor, pointing to Bashar al-Assad. And then, slowly, step by step, these uh, uh, things brought to the demonstrations. Demonstrations of the people that were really angry at the situation that Bashar al-Assad basically tortured the kids, killed the kids. And step by step, it's brought to the situation happening right now in the world. So this reconstruction basically allowed me to answer this question that I was searching. Why? Because as you can saw, at the end of the day, what is the choice of the Syrian people? To die from the torture in their prisons? And all of us heard this amnesty report on Sadnaya prison or recently about crematorium. The another choice is to die in the ISIS hands that was created by Bashar al-Assad. I, on the course of these things, I met with a lot of officers who basically changed the sides, who left the Bashar al-Assad army and went to the side of the Free Syrian army. And I learned from them that at the end of the day, in 2011, 2012, Bashar released two major heavy criminal groups from their own prisons. So you learning the pro through this process how things are escalated, how from the peaceful demonstrations and, and uh, people were asking for freedom, for democracy, for freedom of speech, freedom of expression, it's all escalated into the civil war. And for me, it's real civil war. It's a brothers against brothers. And then with the, all this interference from a lot of different sides and since 2013, it became a proxy war. And then it became the catastrophe of our days. Because at the end of the day, we who are on the West, Western world, we have a lack of knowledge about these people. This is how I felt when I was discovering this. It was a lack of knowledge that keeping us in the darkness that we are fearing these people because we don't know anything why they are coming to Europe, why they are coming to the United States. And then you discover that they are more struggling from ISIS than us even. That ISIS is beheading them mostly and not us, yes, we're suffering from explosions or something, but they're suffering much more bigger uh, uh, losses. So at the end of the day, this journey brought me to a conclusion that I tried to bring to the audience, but I tried to bring it through the voices of these icons, leaders, kids. And like you just mentioned, it is fascinating to see these kids in this uh, story that they are so wise these beautiful girls that you show, you saw in these uh, territories that basically besieged territories, they're so optimistic, they have hope, they're inventing uh, ways how to find food or water. You know what? It's, you know what? it's amazing. Um, at the end of the movie, you saw Bana Alabed. And for me, all three images of the kids became interesting chain. For the first time, I tried to connect all three iconic images, Ilan Kurdi, whom you saw from September 2015, was a kind of resembling for me a death of the young generation of Syria. Then Amran, August 2016, you remember the child in the ambulance? It's resembling for me survival and struggle of these kids. And then Bana Labed, whom you saw at the end of the movie, who was vocal since December when she fled Aleppo, She's the hope. And you know what? These kids are full of hope. They all believe in that they want to go home. You know why most of the... And who been on the Middle East? You've been on the Middle East. You've been in these places. You know what? Who been there? Uh, you must know that most of these people, they are around Middle East. They are stuck in Jordan, in Turkey. They are stuck in uh, Lebanon. They are stuck a little bit in Egypt because they want to be close to their own home. Because there is no home like home. Can I ask you, the, um, one of the striking images is, is not from Syria for me. It's uh, on the island of Samos, 
when they land. And one of the children says, and maybe I'm wrong about this, but he seems to be saying, well, this isn't what we thought it was going to be, um, the arrival on the island. So it does seem as if there is this um, emphasis on the failure of uh, all of us to welcome people who, as you've seen in the previous you know, hour and a half of the movie, have gone through this devastation. We really didn't recognize what they'd suffered, and instead we made them suffer a second time. And, and it seems like that is a strong theme in, or undertone in your... In your I, I think what you just mentioned, and I think this is the answer, that we are, through the media, we are in darkness of what these people went through. And that's why I think European Union and us, we can learn from this situation and understand these people. Because we are lack of knowledge from 2011 up until 2015. We started to pay attention to Syria on the Western media only since 2015 and up until today. What we know about this is rebels. But rebels have a negative connotation in the media. And who is these rebels? It's the people who basically were protesting against the uh, tyranny of the regime. It's the same people like who were protesting here in 2017 uh, against the new administration. It's the people who just want to voice themselves asking for freedom and freedom of expression. And I think that's uh, important for me to emphasize that also European Union, also us, we have lack of knowledge about these people. That's why I think we are fa having this failure because we don't know much about them. So we fear of these people. <clears throat> so I want to ask you what went wrong in the communications, right? So we live in this incredibly thick era of communications, live, Twitter, Facebook. You start the documentary in Dara in the school, and you create this sense that the revolution was started by elementary school students. It's a theme that you come back to uh, again in the movie. And that origin story of, of the war does change our perception of what happened in Syria. Uh, as does the reference to the fact that half of the kids who are refu half of the people who are refugees are, are children. Uh, what went wrong? Why why didn't that aspect of uh, the war in Syria um, and 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 what would necessarily I think flow from that, which is a greater sense of compassion on our part, why didn't that get communicated in the media? Uh, why did it seem as if this was a, a different kind of conflict? You know what, I think the media not always having enough space to portray things. Like, for example, I as a filmmaker have luxury to go learn about these people and allow their voices to be heard through the world. I as a filmmaker can put a comprehensive story versus the small segments of the news and news are limited. So at the end of the day, for example, this year, it was over eight or nine chemical attacks. How many you, you heard in the news? Only one. So at the end of the day, media choosing a lot of times or obligated to put some things much more important than they thinking are. And unfortunately, in the Western world, we can hear every day something on the news, something what's happening in our own country and what's happened there. So there is so much overwhelming things happening in this world, so these things are kind of left there. When I brought Winter on Fire for the first time to United States and things uh, started to roll out, you know what, people were like, wow, we never saw this. We didn't hear about that. And it was also discovery. So a lot of times media overwhelms with things locally, not pointing to what's happening outside. So I think that's why we haven't had a chance to kind of examine what's happened there alone. And we, as documentary filmmakers, I think we have a responsibility and we have a luxury in the same time to learn about these people and to bring this comprehensive story to educate people. So you also, you seem to um, have quite a deep relationship with many of the characters in, in, in the film, both because of the way that you, you produced it, but also just it's clear that you have a connection with them. Are you still in touch with them? What What is yes. um, the state of your relationship with them? I think like in every filmmaking process, you need to allow them to meet you and to trust you. Because remember, I'm outsider for them. And you need to allow them to meet you, 
to understand you and you need to understand them to create this bond and connection in order that they can put everything from their heart into the camera. Because I know that some of them were burned by the media and for me it was important to allow them to open their hearts and minds, same like with the uh, kids or leaders or icons. It was important for me that they can be freely talking on the camera because I wanted their voices to be heard on international screens. So it's not will be only somewhere there, that the whole world can hear them, what's happening there, what's happened there. So we can not be, you know, when I'm jumping a little bit, when I came to them first and I said, I want to make a movie, they said, no, the world neglected us, the world abandoned us. This was the first things that I heard from a lot of Syrian people. And it's true, since 2013, August 21st, 2013, when was the first major massacre that all of you saw, El Guta massacre, when Obama drew the red line, nothing happened, nothing. So for them, they felt that the world literally abandoned them. And for me, it was important to prove them, no, the world just technically don't know anything about you. We are not bad people. We just lack of knowledge about what happened here. And that's true. Did most of these people who are not familiar with Middle East knew what happened? I don't think so. I don't think so. Because for me, it was a major discovery. And I kind of following every possible outlet. Um, I'm going to go to the one Facebook question and then ask you all for your questions. Uh, but quickly, was the fact that you were Russian, did that play at all into people's reactions? Uh, you know what, it was questioned a couple of times, but also I think the Winter on Fire helped me to uh, kind of elevate myself because the fact that Winter on Fire uh, helped to Ukrainian to bring their story out, I think it's helped them to understand that I do have capacity to tell their story outside to the world. And I think the, some of them understood that I'm not Russian, I'm American. And again, we can't say that, you know what, Russians are bad. It's not about Russian nation, it's about government. And then the, it's like to say, oh, Syrians are bad or good. It's a government who play in right. these games. So my question from Facebook is from uh, Jabir Abu, who asks, why has there been inaction on the part of international bodies from the start, just as in Yemen and in Somalia? Oh, I think it's more kind of political questions that I am as a filmmaker. I'm not following these things. So. <laughs> All right. So, yes, please. We're going to ask you to come up to the microphone. I'm sorry, I should have okay. mentioned that earlier and ask your question from the microphone. Anybody else who would like to ask a question, just to save time, if you could uh, also go to the microphone, that would be great. Yeah, something really quick. Is Vanna, the little girl at the end of the movie, at the film, um, the little girl who set up a Twitter account and then disappeared? She's not disappeared? I know, she didn't disappear, but on when you followed her online, one day her Twitter account was taken down and that was Last year, I, I will explain you. But uh, she is still on Twitter. I just was retweeting some of her stuff a few days ago. She's not disappeared. I will tell you something. All of us who proactively tweeting things about Syria, and I know that Banna was trolled a lot of times, you know, about trolling on uh, these things. Her account was trolled a lot of times. It was banned a couple of times. So uh, we who sometimes tweeting a lot of things, our accounts either banned or sometimes even I had situations when my email accounts were hacked and were blocked. So, but Banna is active. I just saw a beautiful post of Banna a few days ago on International Refugee Day where she was again talking about kids in Syria. But I still in touch with her and with her mom and their accounts are working. So you can, yeah. She is seven right now. Thank you so much. Um, this is once again kind of personal, but I saw a film where the soccer star, who also was a singer, was very badly wounded, and I was sort of watching your footage, and he's in homes, or was in homes. Do you know what his destiny has been? Is he alive? Uh, we just spoke about that. He's in prison right now. He's uh, Harald Sham, over months and a half ago, arrested Abdelbasset Sarut. 
and uh, you're talking about Abdel Basset Sarut. Abdel Basset, last time I was talking to him in May, and um, he was arrested by Harald Sham in uh, literally months and a half ago, and I guess sometime after we spoke, and he's still in prison. I was just talking to our friends in Idlib about him yesterday. He's still in prison. He's alive. And everybody waiting for him to be released because they put international pressure right now to release him. Like uh, Gregory mentioned, I do connect it to all my characters. And I guess for me, it's important to continue kind of not conversation, but my connection with them because, you know, they became, through this journey, they became like a part of uh, a group that. You know, really dear to me. They entrusted me with their life stories, despite that it's sometimes danger for them. And I'm in touch with all these characters that you saw in the movie. Hi, I was wondering how much time you spent, kind of where you you shot, because a lot of the footage is from, you know, iPhones or some sort of cellular phones. So, kind of, how did you get those and? How much time were you actually in Syria, or were you in a lot of refugee camps? Just kind of where where were you, and what mm -hmm. was your footage? Mm -hmm. Of course, since 2011, I not was following the characters. I started every research since 2015 when I finished Winter on Fire, and uh, I did all the interviews that you saw in this movie. It was my interviews. Uh, we did shoot a lap of footage of the drone that uh, we did in actually in Aleppo that you saw at the end of the movie. Uh, how I got the footage, you know what, when I started research, it's important, and I guess it's there also mentality, to create the trust. And when the people trust in you, they will refer you to somebody. When you refer to somebody and he also trusts in you, he refers to next. So technically, I was referred to a lot of people who wanted to support this project. And slowly, slowly, we collected over 20, including my interviews, 20 terabytes of footage. I think I have the most sophisticated archives of Syria right now. I can do 20 movies like this, if not more. And uh, I do been in refugee camps. I've been across the entire Middle East and European Union. Because for me, it was important to witness everything with my own eyes, to learn about these people, to understand them, in order to bring this feeling that they are living. And like you mentioned, it's horrifying scenes, it's really hard to watch, but I realized at some point that, you know what, we, my generation, some of the younger generations here, in the United States, European Union, we never saw the war. And unless you will create this feeling that people can understand how painful to lose the child in 21st century, how painful to see what we saw, it's not will make people to reevaluate what we have around us. I think after what I went with this story through the entire Middle East, uh, when I saw how the refugees living, I had a lot of things to think, and I reevaluated a lot of values around me. For me, as the filmmaker who born in Russia and living in the United States, I'm American citizen. It is important to preserve peace and to preserve freedom of speech that these people fighting since 2011. Because this freedom of speech as a filmmaker allows me to make these stories and bring it to the world. And I think for me, it's important not to lose these values because what I learned about this situation, this can happen anywhere in the world, including the United States. And uh, I spent the last two years traveling. Since I finished Inch on the Fire, I was uh, uh, at the beginning for the award campaign here in the United States, and then I was back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and then I was stuck there. But I traveled a lot. I've been crossing border uh, through Turkey, and uh, technically, you're not allowed. It's money. And uh, I've been in Lebanon. I've been in Bekaa Valley, that is Hezbollah territory, actually. I've been in Jordan. I've been in uh, all the European places. And for me, it was important, important to witness things, to learn about these people, so I can pass it as it is. And I will tell you something. When I was working on a cut of the movie, I had a lot of involvement of the Syrians who went through these events. Because for me, the authenticity and the truth 
They are really important. I wanted to tell their story through their eyes how it was. And I even brought some of my characters to Europe where I was editing this in order to check every word, every sound of this movie, every picture of this movie, that it's how it was. And I went to Turkey back, I went to Lebanon back to show this movie to them before it was actually starting screens in the United States. For me, authenticity was important. And that's how it's happened. So it is, um, for me, as I said earlier, just as shocking in some ways to see the failure of our societies to receive um, the refugees in the way that they should have. That said, that many people have welcomed Syrians uh, in Europe and certainly in the Middle East um, and, and elsewhere. Um, and so that, that's a failure uh, that you think or you would think would have a lasting effect on, on, on children. Um, and yet you still have this flame of, of real hope in these kids, yeah. which, which I think is probably more evident in them than is uh, evident in the adults uh, around them. And it seems like that's the next stage that we're facing right now, which is to somehow support these two and a half yeah. million children in a way that allows them to not be completely devastated uh, by what they've experienced and be able to go back yeah. at some point and, and, and rebuild the country. One of the reasons why I focused on the kids in this movie, because you know what, it started with the kids from the school, like we discussed this. And for me, it was a lost generation of the Syrian kids, and in the same time, it's a future generation of the Syria. Because if we will allow them to be educated, they all want to go back to Syria. They all want to rebuild Syria one day. So at the end of the day, as much as it's... Uh, lost, it is the future generation of the Syria. They will rebuild Syria one day. And the, like I said, 70% of the Syrians are on the borders. I found from this school, five of the survivors, five of the kids who survived these massacres and they're alive. Now, four of these kids were in Jordan, then three of them went back to Syria to fight. Some are whom you saw, we filmed on a school where it started, he was in Jordan and he realized he needs to be back in Syria. I saw how many people went back to Syria. Abdel Basset, first I met in, in Turkey, but he went back to Syria. Most of the people, their hearts there, they prefer to die there, and that's why most of these people, they're not trying to escape any further to Latin America or somewhere. They want to be close to the borders. They want to go back to Syria and rebuild it. What? Um can I ask you, is your mission now to take this film out into the world, or are you, are you thinking of doing something with those 20 terabytes of, of footage, or are you onto another project? You know what, uh, 20 terabytes of footage, quite useful. Uh, uh, on the International Refugee Day, we actually helped to fulfill a dream of a main art, a major, major, and a great talent, talented artist, Chris Cornell. And we fulfilled his last dream before he left this world. His last song, Promise, we filled with this footage. And the wow. music video was released. You guys can see it online. Chris Cornell uh, wrote an amazing song. And he actually been in Greece in a refugee camp. And he wanted to dedicate it to refugees. So as you see, we're using this footage to promote the situation. At the same time, I'm not thinking about any other projects because I think there is a lot of important things to learn from this. A, what means real war and how we as a human beings can save the world, what we can learn. Because sometimes we throw in food, but there is a kids who not having food. There is some things that we neglecting, but you know what? Freedom or freedom of speech something that we can lose easily also because our founding fathers stood for that and gave their lives. So it's a lot of important things that I think I can uh, bring to the world and I can talk to the students, to the universities, to younger generation that grow in the United States in the European Union. I think there is a lot of learning things in this movie. As much as it sounds harsh to learn or to watch, I think there is necessity to watch this movie so people can sit, reevaluate, and then do some important 
changes in the life that is around them. It's, it's true, we grew up with this sense that never again, right? The Holocaust, uh, all these atrocities from previous generations, and now this is our reference point. It happened yeah. again. And um, we're really enormously grateful to you, not just for the film, but for dedicating so much of your time and life to promoting um, the truth about what's happening in Syria and making us all more sensitive to it. So thank you, uh, Evgeny. Thank you to our, our online viewers as well who have posted messages from Sierra Leone, Tunisia, Boston, Florida. Um, and thank you to all of you. Thank you. Thank you.